joining us, by the way. It's called What the Jussie Smollett Story Reveals. It shows a peculiar aspect of 21st century America. You call it victimhood chic. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Well, what I mean by that is that, in a way, this isn't surprising what he did. And so, as culpable as he seems to be, and I'm using seems only being very polite, as culpable, you know, I'm going to say it, as, as he is, it, it's clear. Still, he didn't get this out of nowhere. This is a young man who figured out that he could be more interesting as somebody who was jumped by MAGA shouting white guys than he is as the very deft star of a really interesting TV show. And so what this means is that, in a way, all of us are culpable in that, if we are part of this us, we look at, say, the Covington kid, and we look at one millisecond of his smile, and we decide that he symbolizes the racism of all of America, when really it was just a millisecond of that kid walking by somebody and not smiling with his teeth showing. And intelligent people think of themselves as being ahead of the curve in seeing that as a summation of American social history. Now, somebody like Jesse Smollett looks at that zeitgeist, not that specific thing, because that's a little late, but there are all sorts of examples of this over about the past 15 years, and he realizes that if he's somebody who is slightly vainglorious, and many of us are, and he also happens to be black, as many of us are, he thinks that I could be really famous, I could be more important than I am being on this hit TV show doing a really deft performance as a very interesting character that intersects in an interesting way with the person who I am. I could be even more important if I stage this attack. And you can imagine what he was thinking, and I know I'm getting a little bit creative, but you can imagine what he was thinking. He's been attacked. He becomes Jussie Christ, basically. And so he writes a book with somebody. Then he gets to do the audio of the book, and in between the chapters of the book, he would have songs that he wrote, that he recorded. That audio book would become a big hit, and then he would get a talk show, and he would become Jussie Oprah. That's the sort of thing that he was waiting for, because he knows that here in America, not only do we know that racism and homophobia exist, and we should, but he knows that we've gotten to the point that we are so bent on demonizing people like that Covington kid, demonizing somebody who voted for Donald Trump because they didn't prioritize racism as much as some of us do, that he actually thought that it would be a good idea to create something like this and become more famous than he was. And the sad thing is that if it had worked, he's right. He would have that talk show. He would be Jesse Christ. So he uh, apparently met with, uh, the reporting is that he met with uh, the Empire cast and crew tonight. And here is, uh, I think in the third paragraph where it says, after a lot of hugs and kisses uh, of tender friendship, Jussie then expressed a personal message to everybody as a group. First he apologized for any embarrassment they might have felt since his story began. Then to the shock and dismay of the person who attended the meeting, Jussie defiantly stuck to his story of innocence and for the most part paraphrased in his own words what was in the statement that his attorneys put out this afternoon, blaming the legal system and the media for his woes. Oh, the humanity. We have to imagine what's in his head. There are very few evil people, and so we have to imagine how he is going to sleep at night. And where he gets this, you know, he's going to basically go to his grave, rolling his eyes and sprinkling half sentences all over the place when this comes up, implying that there's something that we've all missed. Where he's getting this is the idea that there's this larger narrative that we're supposed to keep in mind even in the place of facts. And so, Mike Brown, it's tragic that he died, but there is still an idea that Mike Brown died with his hands up. Now, the facts have made it quite plain that that's not what happened. There is you know, nothing beyond any shadow of a doubt that that's not how that boy died. But there's a certain sense that we're supposed to believe it on some larger level. I've heard ordinary people talking about it. I've certainly read esteemed intellectuals writing about it as if that somehow happened. Jesse Smollett has grown up in that kind of environment where he watches the facts being skirted in that way, where, say, a Rachel Dolezal, who's a white woman who walks around spray tan pretending that she's black, never says, 
okay, it was all just a big hoax, and now I'm going to be white because that's who I am. But she kind of smirks to the cameras and kind of walks off into the sunset. Jesse Smollett has come of age within that. So as far as he's concerned, his relationship to these facts is about as oblique as those of a certain person with a certain amount of authority who you and I usually talk about. It's the same thing. He drinks it in from the zeitgeist. Now, I'm not saying that it's okay. He is clearly an extreme personality with a certain extreme self-regard, which you can smell from his Twitter feed, from interviews. It's funny. I read an interview with him about three years ago where I had the guiltiest feeling. Now, I'm not talking about the hoax that has come out over the past few weeks. Three years ago, I read a very nice interview with him where I thought, and I hated myself for thinking it because I couldn't think of anything that was wrong with him. I thought, there's something smug about him. It's like he wants to be a civil rights hero of the past, and he's a little uncomfortable that circumstances today don't quite allow it. I swear I thought that, and I would never have written it, and I just went on with my life, but I thought there's something about that guy, and look how there is. That's what turned out to happen. Listen, I, I am over, but I just have to ask you this. What does it mean, race, race issues, as a whole in this country when someone, as you say, and this is a quote from your article, can be acting oppression rather than suffering it? If you quick answer. It's the funniest thing. You know that things have gotten better when somebody can actually feel comfortable pretending to be oppressed rather than really being oppressed. When people were really suffering, you've got the hoses in Birmingham, you've got people redlined, nobody was going to act. That was very rare. Once things get better, you can start turning it into some sort of drama as if we were on empire. And so that means that as tragic and pathetic as what Jelly, Jesse Smollett quote unquote allegedly did, as disgusting as it is, it's a sign that we've come further than we often like to admit. Because if things were really as bad as we're often told, and that's not to say that there is no racism and there's no homophobia, if it really was 1960 except the window dressing had changed, there could not be a Rachel Dolezal and there could never be a serious-minded, intelligent, brilliant performing person like Jesse Smollett who pulls something like this and comes out of it thinking that he's been wronged. We're doing better than we think. John McWhorter.